Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here. A couple of words of introduction. Um, no, I'm from out of state, sorry. And I'm from New York, but I'm from upstate New York, which looks very much like Vermont. <laughs> um, I've also had a little New England experience. I taught for six years at University of Massachusetts down in Amherst, and my son worked at uh, Kiwaden Camp as a counselor. Just down the road a little bit, so we've got some Vermont experience. The road to highway safety is filled with technology, leads through technology. What could be no more technology than autonomous vehicles? So here I am to talk about this, and it works. What I propose to do is do two parts of a talk here. The, the first part is AV 101 what you should know about them in very shortly and in concise form. And the second part is, what are the issues? What things should you in Vermont think about regarding autonomous vehicles? And my specialty is the safety portion of all of this, but I've been asked to talk about other things as well. So we'll talk about the broader societal issues and the environmental issues and things like that. I will raise issues and I will raise questions. I will not give you answers. Because that's for you to talk about in the later portion of the afternoon, after I get off the stage and a panel comes up with people who know a lot more about this than I do, and we'll raise a number of questions, get your views on those questions, and proceed. So that's it. Why am I here in the first place? Because I wrote this report. I was asked by Governor's Highway Safety Association, that's the trade association of all 50 states and DC, the highway safety officers, you in Vermont are a member of it. And they said about a little over a year ago, gee, this autonomous vehicle thing is really happening very rapidly. And while a few states are out in front of it, a lot of states are not. And they don't know what they, what they should know what they should do, what they should think about, what they shouldn't do. So will you write a report for us? Not a techie report, but a straightforward report that anybody can read. So at that point, I didn't know, didn't know anything about autonomous vehicles except what I occasionally read in the newspaper, but I got a little bit smarter uh, shortly. And this is the report. It's available on the GHSA website. Uh, I encourage you to get a copy if you want to learn more. Okay, so autonomous means they drive themselves, yeah? So what's the problem? Uh, when everything is autonomous, it'll be a big change from transportation being something you have to own and have in your garage all the time to something you can call up, like you can call in for pizza. Uh, and there won't be any crashes. You heard earlier this morning that humans are responsible for 94% of all fatal crashes. So. If the machines are perfect, then there won't be those 94%, and we'll go from 35,000 plus fatalities a year down to less than 3,000. And it's coming very rapidly. Um, there are 26 states in D.C. with autonomous vehicle legislation of some sort that is, is in place right now, uh, Vermont being one of those. Um, just, there's just a map to show you what the states are that have done things. They're all, they're all over the place. I might point out that there's a wide variety of the kind of legislation that states have introduced. Some states, California probably being the best example, have really tight regs about what's required to test an autonomous vehicle, and they are very rapidly moving into regs for what's required to operate an autonomous vehicle. To date, all the testing has been done on autonomous vehicles with a backup driver in the front seat that can take control if necessary. But California is putting in regs in place by the end of this year to allow testing of non-driver autonomous vehicles, and they will probably be on the road by next spring sometime. That's how rapidly this is coming. But the states, as I say, vary considerably from California and a couple of other states that are very tightly regged to others of these laws that say, do a study. 
fact, one state had a law that said, do a study, but then the legislature didn't fund the study, so nothing's happening there. So a wide variety of responses by states to the issue of autonomous vehicles. Okay, so it should be good and it should be simple, but. Okay, now begins the AV 101 section. What are these things? And the first thing you should know is that it's not an it, it's a range. There are five different levels of autonomous vehicles that have been defined. This is a graphic which you provided, in fact. And the point of this graphic is the portion in blue is how much control the driver has. The portion in green is how much control the vehicle has. And as you go from level zero, no autonomy, no self-driving at all, to level five, that increases from nothing to everything. This will explain this a little bit more. Level zero, nothing. Level one, the vehicle can do something, and the best example is cruise control. I'm willing to bet virtually every vehicle that you drove here today has some cruise control in it. Level two can do a couple of things. Uh, cruise control or lane keeping, and maybe even cruise control and uh, distance following. But still, you have to have a driver there in the driver's seat with hands on the wheel, one hopes, monitoring the road in case the situation requires the driver to take over. There's a big red line there between levels two and levels three, and that's important because at level three, the vehicle can take over and drive itself in some situations. Level three says, I can drive myself in, in a, some situations, but the driver still has to be there, ready to take control when I, the vehicle, tell the driver, you need to take control now. So you're on a freeway, but some, something happens, some car starts pushing in toward you, you have to take control very rapidly. So the driver must be there, must be able to take control. Level four can operate completely by themselves in certain defined situations. That's called the operational design domain. And you don't have to remember that, but we'll come back to it later. In those situations, the driver, the, the car can be fully in control, but as soon as it leaves those situations, the, a driver must take over. What do I mean by situation? It both could be geographically fenced. I can operate within this urban area or within speed limits less than such and such. It also can be weather related. I can operate by myself in this, situ in this area as long as it's not snowing. But if it starts snowing, I can't operate. Or other sorts of things. So there's this mix, full operation in some situations and not in others. Level five, which is what everybody thinks about when they talk about AVs, are the vehicle is in control all the time, any situation. We aren't there yet, but we will get there. So how rapidly is this coming? Uh, you know level one has been available for years. Level two, best example, is the Tesla autopilot. And you suspect, I suspect all of you have heard about the Tesla. Uh, it can more or less operate itself in certain situations. The driver is supposed to be there, but there are documented instances of people driving a Tesla while riding on the roof. I kid you not. And of course, there was a fatality in one of these. We'll come back to that in a minute. Levels three through five are coming soon. And this is an example. Google, which is now called Waymo, has got three and a half million miles of test driving under its belt. And probably 100 times that many miles of simulation driving. I mean, they are really doing this. Uh, there are now more than 40 companies testing in California. More than 40. And there have been various predictions by a number of people that say we will have an AV of some level, level four or level, probably level four, available by 2020 or very shortly thereafter. And these predictions happen almost every week. I can't keep track of them. 
The thing I want you to take away from this is look at that list of companies on the bottom. What sorts are they? Some of them are traditional automobile manufacturers. Some of them are high-tech companies like Google. Uh, some of them are things you've never heard of. These 40 companies plus that are testing in California include some startups, some AV startups. So it's a very different mix from the folks that have made automobiles in the past. Okay, that's what they are, that's what's coming, and they're coming soon. Now, how does one of these things work, really? And this is an example that's taken from a report that Google issued two weeks ago, again, showing how rapidly this all changes. It starts with a map. This is not a Google Maps map that is just generic. This is a very specific map of that road that writes down and records everything. The width, the posts, the signals, everything fixed, all the striping, absolutely everything. This is something that Waymo does before they operate any of their test vehicles on any road. They don't just take it out in the, side, in the country and start driving someplace. Starts with a map. Then, when you're driving, it senses, the vehicle does, what's around it, what's movable that could impose on that road on which it wishes to drive. What you see at the bottom there is a video picture looking out the front. And what you see on the top, the diagram, is how it keeps track of these things. That big green thing up in the upper left, that's a bus. The small green thing next to it, that's another car. The orange things over on the right, that's a, a bicycle and a pedestrian. So it keeps track of everything that's movable. Cars, bikes, pedestrians, cats, <laughs> animals, balls rolling into the street. It keeps track of everything. And not only does it keep track of where it is, but it predicts where everything will move, if it can move, based on where it's been. It keeps track of the motion and predicts the next stage of the motion. Okay, now if I know where everything is, the fixed portions, and where I think everything is going to go, based on where it has gone, and where it's come from, and how fast it's moving, only then do I choose the route where I will move my vehicle. And it does this every tenth of a second or every hundredth of a second or something. This is a continuous process going on all the time. Rough idea of how they work now? So all the time, checking the environment, checking what's moving, checking what's different, and then picking the spot on which I go next. OK, that's what they are. That's how they work very briefly. Uh, what can you expect to be in the fleet? Uh, how rapidly will these things come on? At this point, it's guesswork, but this is the best kind of guesswork that I've been able to pull together based on what I read. Uh, this is guessing of how much the autonomous vehicles will be in the fleet, what proportion will be in the fleet over what 10-year uh, time span. The blue is a sort of lower estimate, and the bottom at the top is higher estimate. 2020s, not too many. 2030s, maybe 10 to 20 percent. 2040s, maybe 20 to 40 percent. 2050s, uh, 40 to 60 percent. So not completely in the fleet um, until 2050s, 2060s, and maybe not even then. Let's say these are big deal guesses. And one never quite knows how accurate these guesses are. They're based on not just uh, holding my fingers up in the air, but they're based on vehicle fleet turnover. I mean, cars are expensive operations, and you're not going to sell your car tomorrow just because one of these things comes around. Price point, because initially AVs will cost more than non-AVs. Previous introduction of a technology into the fleet. How long did it take airbags, for example, to get into all of the new vehicles and to get into a major proportion of the fleet? So it's based on things like that. It's not strictly guesses. But there's a big takeaway that I want you to take from here, 
which is that there will be a mix of autonomous vehicles and ordinary driver-driven vehicles on the road for a good long time. Certainly for all of my remaining lifetime, and probably for a good lot of yours. Okay. What does the public think about these things? And here I'm going to take a, a little what freedom from my position up here, and we're going to do a little very informal polling to see if you think the rest of the way the rest of the public does. We can do some sophisticated polling in the next half of the session, and I won't do that, but I just want show of hands right now on your act, your reaction. Uh, what do you think about the proposal of wide use of AVs? Are you Excited about this, or are you worried about this? How many excited? How many worried? Okay, you're, you're fairly typical. Uh, what do you think about, will they reduce crashes? How many think yes? How many think no? You're far ahead of the public because you're in the business. You, you understand crashes, you understand crash causation more than the general public does. Would you ride in one today? I mean, a completely autonomous vehicle, you're in the back seat, there's nobody in the front seat. How many yes? How many no? You're just like the rest of the public, yeah? High degree of skepticism here. Would you buy one if one were available today? How many yes? How many no? Okay. Um, final question. If you bought one, would you prefer one in which the driver can take control if the driver wants to? In other words, it has a steering wheel, it has pedals, so you can drive it yourself if you want to, but you can turn it over and let it drive autonomously if you don't. How many yeses would like one like that? How many noes? Yeah, okay. You're, you're fairly like the rest of the public in these surveys, except that you know more about crash causation, so you know more than that. Um, now, having said this, part of all of this is familiarity. I will bet that most people in the room have never ridden in one of these things yet. And as you all know, the more familiar you get with something, the more comfortable you get with it, the easier you are to accept it and to use it. You all know that some technologies can take over very rapidly. And I point to this as an example. Fifteen years ago, these did not exist. Now I am willing to bet my lunch, since I've already had it, <laughs> that there isn't anybody in this room that doesn't have one of these. Am I right? Okay, I don't have to pay for my lunch. Okay. So technology can take over very rapidly, and people's initial feelings when new technology come may not be the same as their feeling 10, 15 years ago. There's a famous saying that was attributed to Henry Ford uh, shortly after he introduced Model T's, he said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they wouldn't have said cars, they would have said faster horses. Well, technology can indeed move very rapidly and can take over. But again, the takeaway is, for you as highway safety people, there will be a mix of AVs and driver vehicles on the road for a good long time and your safety issue is how to deal with this mix. And what's the big deal safety issue? It's the driver behavior. The drivers, both of the AVs, to the extent that they have drivers, and the, the other road users. And I give you three examples of recent crashes involving AVs to sort of illustrate the, the points here. There have been a goodly number of crashes of the Waymo has had, I believe, over 40 crashes reported in their testing so far, most of them very low uh, level, and most of them caused by other vehicles. But here are three. The first one's the Tesla fatality. That was level two. It shouldn't have been driven that way anyway. There's a very extensive investigation of this by the National Transportation Safety Board. 
And it determined that the driver had his hands off the steering wheel for most of the 40 minutes or so before the crash, and that the driver ignored warnings from the vehicle to, you've got to take control. Remember I said level threes, those are the vehicles in which the driver has to be ready to take control when the vehicle tells him to. This is, a, this is a level two, it isn't even level three, and he did not. He crashed sideways into a semi-trailer that was white and that the technology didn't pick up and, and died. Number two, I wish I had a diagram, but I don't. Of uh, uh, two of the three lanes of traffic, the Waymo car is in the second lane from the outside, and there's a bus coming up in the inner lane. And the traffic is stopped in the, the Waymo car's lane. He's pulling out into the left-hand lane to get around the stopped car. The bus is coming up from behind him. The bus assumes the car won't pull out. The car doesn't see the bus or assumes the bus will stop. Two assumptions inflicted, crash. Not a severe one. I call this one a, a joint responsibility. Now, partially it's the, that the autonomous vehicle didn't anticipate that bus coming up and partially it's the bus driver and it didn't stop. Uh, the top picture incidentally is the Tesla fatality. The bottom picture is of the Uber car. Um, similar sort of stopped traffic situation. The Uber car was coming up the, the left-hand lane or stopped traffic on two lanes in front of him. The Uber car was proceeding straight and the driver was coming in the cross street and just saw the two stop lanes of cars and proceeded in T-boned the Uber car. This was very serious. It's down there in the bottom. And this one, if you will, is responsibility of the driver uh, and the other regular car. He should have assumed that there might have been a, a vehicle in that delay. And then number four, kids running in front of ADs. There are documented instances of this, too. Hey, I see this thing. It's got this funny thing on top. It must be autonomous. Let me run in front of it and see if it'll stop. Now, one can extrapolate this a little bit to my situation of mix, mixes of AVs and non-AVs. If you're at a, a two-way intersection and you see a car to your left and you say, hey, that's an autonomous one, wait, I can go first because I know it'll wait for me. It behaves itself. So you can see the conflict potentially between assuming that the AV will drive the way it's supposed to. Um, there's an institutional challenge here, too. Um, and I call it hardware versus software. Cars traditionally are hardware, right? They're pieces of machinery. You build them, you send them out, a customer buys them, the state registers them, the DMV registers this vehicle, it licenses the driver of this vehicle. The vehicle, you know, won't change very much. You can soup it up a little bit, but it's still the same basic vehicle. What's an AV? There's some hardware there too, but it's basically software. You can change that software overnight. Tesla has done this already. When the hurricanes came through Florida, it changed the software on the Teslas down there, so the range was extended. Tesla currently makes vehicles that, with a push of button back in Tesla headquarters, will turn into level 5 AVs, or at least level 4 AVs. So the, the vehicle can change instant, almost instantly from a level 2 to a level 3 to a level 4 or a level 5. How do you account for that as a state? It can be a different car one day to the next. And this muddies the old federal and state roles because the feds were in charge of ensuring the safety of vehicles. I mean, you had to obey the federal motor vehicle standards. You had to do defects and defect recalls and all of that. And states were in charge of registering vehicles, licensing drivers, setting laws, and enforcing laws, and so forth. But this blurs that distinction. What's the vehicle and what's the driver? So a new way of thinking things. As I said before, many players involved, uh, many issues, some of which I'll get into a little bit more. And it's moving very, very quickly. Um, 
as an example of moving very quickly. Um, the college professors here know about Google Scholar, right? It's the source in which you look up scientific papers written on any subject and it has a sort of complete list of all the papers that have been produced. I went and did a search on Google Scholar of papers with autonomous and either vehicle or vehicles in their title, written in 2017. How many did I get? I got 1,100 of them. 1,100 scientific papers written about autonomous vehicles since January 1st. And that, that was just the ones that had these two words in the title. So it's all happening so doggone fast. Um, I'll make a point here that there's been NHTSA guidance released. Um, last version came out in September. It's guidance in the sense that it's suggestive rather than regulatory. Uh, it encourages rather than requires. It's a framework, it's not in detail. Uh, it refers to vehicles of levels three through five, which they call automated driving systems. Uh, these are the points that they want the developers to do. These are the things that previously would have been on Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards if they were regulating hardware. I'm not going to go through them all, but you see the sort of issues that they're worried about. Uh, designing it well, having a system involved to, to make sure that your software is running properly, to check it continually. If the software is not operating properly or if it stops at some point, get the vehicle off into a safe situation. The cybersecurity, crash worthiness, and so forth. These, these are NHTSA type issues and these are developer type issues. They're issues the state should be aware of, but they're not ones that you have to deal with directly. These are the issues that they raise for states. And they're very, very general. Yeah? They don't tell you what of anything. They just tell you you should think about these. And we'll talk about a few of them in a minute here. Uh, some of them are absolutely no-brainers. Uh, yes, you should have a lead agency and a committee. You should figure out how you want to do AD testing. And we'll talk about that and so forth. And you should figure out, which I'm not going to talk about much, liability insurance. An AV is in a crash. Who is lying? Okay, now we're going to talk about issues you, for you to think about, and we'll do that in two sections. First is testing, and second is operations. Okay? And the three topics at the bottom are the three topics for the subsequent discussion that we will be having right after break. So, testing. <clears throat> Testing occurs on public roads. That means you have to be prepared to assure the safety of other drivers on those public roads. And these are pretty standard things that you should think about before you start allowing testing in Vermont, which you do not yet allow. Uh, <clears throat> is there an application procedure? How and where? Who do you notify? Who is the driver? Uh, vehicle identification, reporting, things like that. These are pretty well documented in the NHTSA report. These are pretty well documented by other states that have taken the lead on doing things like this. And some of them prescribe these pretty well. And some of them say, just go ahead and do what you want to do, testing organization. As long as you've got a big enough in, uh, insurance bond behind you, uh, we don't care. Now. When you get to operations, think of a level four or a level five of, here's where life gets really interesting. Who is the driver? It's operating autonomously. Something happens. Is it the human in the vehicle? Human may be a five-year-old child being taken home from school. <laughs> is it the person who engages it? Is it the registered driver of that vehicle? or the registered owner of the vehicle? Is it the manufacturer or is it the software provider? Or how does it fit between the vehicle manufacturer and the software provider? Big deal issue here. You need to think about it. 
Compliance with traffic laws. Uh, first question is how do AVs comply with existing traffic laws? And I just give you the speed limit as an example since you've heard speeding talked about earlier today. To date, all AVs that have been tested have been programmed strictly to obey the traffic laws, like strictly to obey the speed limit. How uh, should you program an AV strictly to obey the speed limit? This has raised problems in California. The AV is trying to merge onto a freeway. Uh, moving traffic at the freeway is moving uh, eight, nine miles over the speed limit. If I try to pull out in front of that, I have a potential crash situation. But okay. And if I'm driving on, as Vermont has plenty of, the two lane country roads, uh, some of them are perfectly straight without any up and down hills. I bet on those the typical travel speed is not a posted 55 mile an hour speed. If I program my AV to go strictly 55, I may generate lines of people mad at me behind me. I may generate improper passing. I may generate some road rage. Or do I program the AV to disobey the speed limit? In other words, tell it. Speed limit doesn't mean what it says. There are other simpler things. If I'm on the two-lane road and there's a vehicle stopped, parked halfway on the road, halfway off the road, there's a double yellow line, I look out, nobody's coming. It makes perfectly good sense to me to pull around this vehicle and carry on going. I'm formally disobeying the, the traffic law because I'm crossing a double yellow line. That's supposed to be illegal. But it makes perfectly good sense here. Everybody realizes that. And there are lots of these little gray areas. There will need to be some law changes if AVs, four, levels four and five, come into play. Um, example, how about, tech, how about handheld cell phone devices? I mean, if it's a perfectly level, good level four and it's completely driving itself, why shouldn't I be able to use my phone? Why, for that matter, shouldn't I be able to use this to get me home from the bar when I've had three six packs? I'm absolutely impaired and should not be driving. But it could be the solu complete solution to the drunk and drug driving problem, but you need to change the laws to allow that. Or commercial operation. The commercial folks would really love to have autonomous vehicles for long distance trucking because they could do platoons of four and five vehicles. Tremendous fuel savings if they do that. But Every state has a law that's about following too closely and how, is, how much is that a law. So those kind of laws need to be changed. Um, there are a few more examples there. I think New York, where I come from, is the only state that has a formal law that says a driver must have his or her hands on the steering wheel at all times. But anyway. Uh, oh, let me go back for one. The, the take control when required. If I'm in a level three or a level four, do you want some sort of regulation that says you must be prepared as a driver to take control? What if I'm sound asleep? Can I be sound asleep in a level three? And level three says, hey, take control. It's starting to snow. How long does it take you to wake up from sound asleep and be able to take charge of a vehicle? I've seen some research on that that says, 20 seconds, more or less, is a, is a good round number. Lots can happen on the road in 20 seconds. Um, let's see, did we, did we get there? Oh, yeah. Licensing, we've talked about that a little. You need to figure that out. Um, licensing for the level three or level four. Data systems, this is a big deal for the DMVs. How do you identify one of these things how do you identify what level it is? How do you identify if it changes its level because of a software change that somebody pushed the button tonight and said, okay, now I can do it. Uh, how do you identify if it's a level four, what is its operational design domain? How can you tell um, that it's only allowed to operate on roads with less than 40 miles speed limit? or not permitted to, level, to operate on gravel roads or something like that. How do you punch that into your identification system? Um, education, 
how do you educate folks, the three and four drivers, and all AV users, and for that matter, how do you educate the general public as to how to behave around these things? Law enforcement, a bunch of issues here, and I'll hit a few highlights. How do you identify one of these guys coming down the road? How can you tell if it's autonomous or not? How do you flag it over? Uh, vehicle pursuit, I, I see somebody doing something, I want him to go, how do I chase it now? Uh, I've had an inquiry just this last week on uh, carrying contraband. Uh, how do I deal with something like that? At a crash scene, emergency responders, how do I tell if this thing is an autonomous vehicle? How do I tell when it won't suddenly wake up and decide to go home? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm serious here. Uh, general officer and responder safety. Okay, here into some different environmental issues for you to think about. Uh, roadways, you heard this talked about a little bit previously. Do I need to change anything on road markings to accommodate these? Uh, dirt roads, snow and ice, can they operate in the snow and ice or not? What I know now is that they are being tested in snow, in some countries, notably in Sweden. And the testing will continue. The intention very definitely is to have AVs fully capable of operating in rain and probably in snow, unless it's a good Vermont snow and it's 18 inches, but then nobody operates it. Uh, environmental issues will be substantial. With a large number of AVs, you can see much lower need for on-street parking. I mean, your AV can take you to work, work if you work in an office, it can go back home, it can take Junior to the soccer game, it can then come back and pick you up. Uh, it'll help traffic flow, absolutely, because it'll uh, smooth out things and it'll probably improve capacity for roadways. It may even impact uh, where people live because it may encourage people to live further out from central cities I don't have to spend that hour in the car driving concentrated, but I can spend the hour in the car <clears throat> reading a newspaper or getting on the internet or sleeping or doing whatever else I can. Somehow a house away, an hour away from my job isn't nearly as onerous as it is if I have to do the driving all myself. There's an enormous benefit for the mobility impaired the senior citizens, for disabled, for children, and so forth. So the advantages, completely apart from safety, are enormous. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, oh, I, here it was. As I say, land, land use, we just talked about that. Employment issues are a real big deal. I did not know until I looked it up that there are two million long distance truck drivers in America. What's going to happen to their jobs? Not to mention the taxi drivers. It's, it's a very large uh, economic issue there. <coughs> hey, body repair shops. <laughs> okay, I, I wouldn't mind to see fewer of them, but it's an economic change. Um, probably fewer cars needed. If, if one car is used by more families than, than, than currently. And then the data security issue is one that I'm not competent to talk about, but if people could hack my laptop, they certainly can figure out how to hack my car. And what they will do with my car once they hack it, I'm not sure, but I don't want to find out. Okay, I will conclude with some general advice uh, Number one is be informed and stay informed. Uh, this will happen, no question. This will happen and uh, you can either be a leader in helping it happen and making it happen the way you want it to. You can sort of be a bystander and take what happens or you can ignore it and have it dumped upon you. Don't do that. Be a player, 
I strongly recommend a, a task force with all of the agencies, and this alliance may be the perfect place to do that kind of a task force because you've got lots of different places here, players here. Invite the manufacturers and the uh, developers in. I mean, if Uber wants to operate, does Uber operate in Vermont? Yes. Invite them in. Okay. Uh, if manufacturers want to test in, in Vermont, invite them in. Because the, the as you know, in, in things like this, the more you talk to each other, the more you figure out what the issues are and what the problems are, the more you can develop solutions beforehand rather than having problems come afterwards. Consider your laws and regs carefully. Look at what other states have done. See what their experience has been. Some of them are a little ahead of you. There is a report coming out shortly from AMBA, and Kathy Curtis probably will tell you about that. We'll give you some very good suggestions there. And be flexible, because if you think you know what it is today, it'll be something different next week in this game. Literally, there is a new story in, in the press almost every week. <clears throat> this is my wish list of what I think, well, I hope would happen at a national level. And I say number one is coming from AMBA. I would like to see a documentation of the issues so every state doesn't have to make them up themselves. And I would like to see some model public ed materials for people who own or will own AVs and for people who have to interact with them. I would like to see an AV information clearinghouse. AMBA has a fairly good one, NHTSA has one, but none of, none of them is complete. Uh, I would like to see really good regs that state could use on a consistent way of identifying AVs in state uh, <coughs> DMV files and so forth so we don't have to make up different ones and juggle between the various states. And be sure to get the law enforcement involved. They have not been involved as much as they should have been in the development up until now. It's been largely driven by the techies. We need to get the people involved, and in law enforcement is absolutely the right place to do that. Final word, this was a, an editorial in the Sunday New York Times two weeks ago. It's hard to read from the back, but it says, not so fast on self-driving cars, because there are a bunch of issues need to be think, thought about carefully, and we've tried to at least give a few of them here. That's all I have to say. There's the report. There's where to find it if you're interested in that. And there will likely be a successor to this. The GHSA has asked me to do another version of it just because things have happened so fast. So expect by this summer to be uh, announced by the GHSA annual meeting at the end of August an updated version. So thank you very much for your time.